Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're going to give everyone a moment to settle in and we will start shortly at two o'clock. But while we are waiting for everyone to join us, if you wouldn't mind um, in the chat box, letting us know where you're from. So um, if you could please share um, your name, your agency, your role and where you're joining us from. All right, welcome everyone from joining us. It is 1.59, so I'm gonna go ahead and at least start some of the housekeeping uh, information just because I want us to maximize the, um, the time our presenters have. Um, we're really looking forward to today's presentation. So thank you for joining us. Um, so a few things to um, remind you about. So welcome to the Gender-Based Violence and American Indian Alaska Native Communities webinar. Um, so to make most out of today's event, please make sure you use your earbuds, your earphones, um, and have stable internet connection. Um, if you're having any technical difficulties, you could always try to log on and log back off using that link that you used. Um, if not, you can always send me um, a direct message and I can see if I can provide any support. You can also email us at cpe at sswumaryland.edu and I'll have that information in the, the chat box so you can, if you have any technical issues, you can always email us or give us a call. Um, please, during today's webinar, please use the chat box feature that is on the the toolbar at the bottom. It's the little bubble. It says Q&A. So please use um, the Q&A box to ask any questions for our presenters. The slides and the recordings will be posted in the next upcoming week. So please um, look out for that email to let you know when that you'll have access to the recording of this webinar. We just want, we have a few acknowledgements. Um, Rutgers School of Social Work, the Violence Against Women's Research Consortium, um, the National Institute of Justice, NIA, or NIJ, excuse me, and the University of Maryland School of Social Work. Um, so this virtual brown bag is supported in part by the award number 2016 MUBX 
K011 awarded by the National Institute of Justice. Um, and just a disclaimer, any opinions or points of views expressed in this presentation are those of the presenters and do not necessarily represent the official position or policies of the U.S. Department of Justice. Um, and with that information, I'm going to introduce uh, Nancy Levine. She is the director of the National Institute of Justice. Welcome, Nancy. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning for those of you on the West Coast. It's my pleasure to be joining you today uh, to help launch this webinar in observance of the National American Heritage Month, Native American Heritage Month. Um, now, we know that this month is a time when we honor uh, Native American heritage, but we also know that one month is not enough. We should really honor it every day because it's the very fabric of our nation and has been an integral part of NIJ's tribal crime and justice research, both generally and specifically for a violence against American Indian and Alaska Native women program of research. And we're very appreciative and really delighted to partner with the Violence Against Women Research Consortium to share with you today what we know about the strength and resiliency of tribal communities in the face of substantial oppression, of violence, and of victimization. Uh, now, um, I have joined NIJ as its director. I started in May of this year, but it's not my first time at NIJ. I was actually working here at the Institute back in the 1990s. I know that dates me a bit, um, but of course, I was working in a very different role. And as much as that role was different, some things have not changed. And one is the amazing work that this institute supports and the exceptional staff. And I've particularly been impressed with NIJ's Violence Against Women and Family Violence Research and Evaluation Program, which is managed by Christine Crossland. She goes by Tina. Many of you know her. And she has developed our Violence Against American Indian and Alaska Native Women Program of Research. Um, she is dedicated, she is committed, she digs deep, she wants to get it right, she knows the value of research and she's been an amazing leader in this field. She has brought so much knowledge and expertise to this work. And she alone is a major reason why we've made substantial strides, strides in understanding preventing and intervening in violence against indigenous women. Uh, but we have much more work to do, and I'm, I'm well aware of that. Um, this is certainly a priority issue for me as a research topic. I also have priorities as a director that span research topics, and they're more about the nature of the research process. And one of my key priorities is what I'm calling inclusive research. And that's making sure that no matter the topic, no matter the methodology, whether it's solely qualitative or solely quantitative or mixed methods, that it's vitally important that we make sure that we engage with the people that are closest to the issue or problem being studied. And that, and relatedly, another priority of mine is what I'm calling approaching the research through an equity lens. Um, and that lens is so important when you think about the criminal justice system and the history of our country in the context of the justice system and the deeply rooted uh, disparities, inequalities, discrimination, bias, racism, et cetera. Like we cannot disentangle that history and those factors that continue on today from the nature of the research we engage in. And, and I'm not just talking about research that's specifically looking at disparities by race or, or ethnicity or gender um, or, 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 or any of those other important um, identity factors. Um, that's important. We funded such work and we'll continue to fund that work. But I would argue that every research topic in our space requires that type of an equity lens. I, I'm really pleased to share that even though these are my priorities as NIJ's new director, um, they've been um, followed in, um, by staff, uh, Tina and many others, especially 
in terms of NIJ's tribal crime and justice research. Um, in, in particular, the, the, our tr tribal crime and justice research is and has been collaborative and participatory. Uh, the type of research that we sponsor and, and engage in uh, that is, aspires to understand criminal and juvenile justice problems in American Indian and Alaska Native communities is really embedded in this notion that we need to involve the people affected by these issues in the design and the implementation and the collection, the analysis of data, and of course, in the interpretation of research findings. So this type of collaborative and participatory process helps ensure that research and evaluation is um, sensitive to tribal culture, um, the world views um, and the differences and diversity of tribes and cultures and languages. And it also ensures that research methods respect tribal sovereignty, customs, and traditions. So I'm very delighted to know that in addition to our Violence Against Women research solicitation, we also plan to release our Tribal Research Capacity Building grant solicitation in this fiscal year. So keep an eye out on that. Unfortunately, that the solicitation uh, was not released last year, but I'm happy to know that it will be released uh, this year, and I'm very proud of that. So thank you again for taking the time to join us for this webinar. And thanks to the researchers who will be sharing their knowledge, which is so important and impactful. Thanks for all that all of you do to promote safer communities and more equitable justice systems. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely opening remark. And now I'm, a, I'm going to be able to introduce Dr. Katie Schultz. She is a PhD in MSW and a citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. And she is also an assistant professor of social work at the University of Michigan. Her research focuses primarily on responding to violence and associated outcomes and understanding community and cultural connectedness in American Indian and Alaska Native communities. Current studies include one focused on risk and protective factors related to justice involvement among a native population and another investigating social networks and associations with substance use, violence, and suicide amongst um, American Indian adolescents. Dr. Schultz, thank you and take it away. All right, thank you for that introduction. Thank you for the opportunity to facilitate this uh, very important conversation today. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of background on the consortium and the objectives today and then jump right into the presentation since that's who we're here to hear from. Uh, the Violence Against Women's Research Consortium is a collaborative project with the Center for Research on Ending Violence at Rutgers, the University of Maryland School of Social Work, and the National Institute of Justice. The focus of the consortium is to identify gaps in research and practice in the areas of intimate partner violence, sexual violence, stalking, and teen dating violence. Another goal is to implement research and evaluation projects to fill gaps in our current knowledge in the field of gender-based violence. A final goal is to disseminate research to, wide, to a wide range of audiences. Objectives for today are related to gender-based violence in American Indian Alaska Native communities. We've got a tall order for our panelists. Uh, we will be talking about how to better understand the scope and profile of missing Native American persons in Nebraska, understanding how settler colonial historical oppression has imposed and perpetrated structural violence against indigenous peoples, identify culturally relevant promotive and protective factors, provide an example of indigenous research that is promotive against historical oppression, understand how all are accountable for dismantling internalized colonial mindset, prevent complicity in perpetrating settler colonial historical oppression institutionally, interpersonally, and internally. Uh, we will also give descriptions from the National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey, interpret estimates of violence against American Indian and Alaska Native women and men, and identify implications for policy and practice. So as I said, uh, quite a tall order for the panelists who are about to uh, 
come after I do this next brief inter, uh, we'll have three presentations today. So the first will focus primarily on missing persons, native peoples in Nebraska. I'm gonna give a brief introduction uh, to our three presenters, and then I will turn it over to them to take it away. The first of our three is Dr. Emily Wright. Uh, Dr. Wright is an assistant vice chancellor for research and creative activity and professor in the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice at the University of Nebraska, Omaha. She is also a member of the Cherokee Nation and serves on the US Department of Justice Task Force on Research on Violence Against American Indian and Alaska Native Women. Her research focuses on violence against women and children, particularly those in marginalized populations. Welcome, Dr. Wright. Uh, our next presenter in this panel, this next presentation, is Dr. Tara Richards. Dr. Richards is a distinguished associate professor in the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice at the University of Nebraska Omaha and a faculty lead for UNO's Victimology and Victim Studies Research Lab. Her research focuses on prevention, intervention, and system response to sexual assault, intimate partner violence, child abuse, and neglect. And finally, last but certainly not least, uh, Sheena Gilbert is joining us. Sheena is a PhD student in the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice at the University of Nebraska Omaha and a citizen of the Stockbridge Muncie tribe. Shout out, got a lot of good friends there. We'll have to play Who Do We Know afterwards. Um, her research focuses on victimization in underserved populations, indigenous crime and victimization, and policy reform and campus sexual victimization. So with that, I'm very excited to hear what our presenters have to say, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you, thank you. So as with our tech uh, check-in, my PowerPoint still doesn't wanna work. So <laughs> give me a second. It's always something. It's not really a Zoom meeting with a presentation if it doesn't work, is kind of the way I feel. Here we go. All right, Sheena, I'm going to let you start us off and then I will take it at the methods. Sounds good. <clears throat> So as Dr. Schultz said, um, our, pre our presentation today is looking at missing or murdered indigenous persons in uh, Nebraska. So go ahead, next one. So this research um, uh, in this presentation was sponsored by the National Institute of Justice under the NIJ grant number 2019-75-DX0014. Therefore, the conclusions expressed in this presentation are those of the presenters and don't necessarily reflect the views of the National Institute of Justice. And we also believe that without the funding from NIJ, uh, we're pretty certain that this work uh, would not have been done. Next. So when it comes to missingness and disparities in Native American communities, there are some things that we have to consider. First, there are some social disparities and experiences with violence that may contribute to an environment where individuals either intentionally or unintentionally go missing. So um, in Native communities, it is not uncommon that they suffer these social disparities would be like poverty, um, isolation, low educational attainment, high unemployment rates, uh, substance abuse. So we need to consider that context when we think about missingness in, among this population. Also, we need to consider that Native Americans have been subjected to genocide, colonization, and racism since the country's inception. Um, specifically, when it comes to colonization, we need to think about um, forcefully being removed from their communities and relocated onto what we now call reservations. Um, forced assimilation, specifically when children were sent to boarding schools. So again, we need to consider that um, context when we think about missingness. And then um, basically, yeah, any study um, in this population, specifically for this uh, research, um, Native American missing persons, it needs to be understood within that historical context 
and how these ongoing structural inequalities and disparities can make them more vulnerable to going missing. Um, again, um, with this research, there is, it kind of like came out of this national attention to the problem of missing or murdered Native Americans. Um, in 2019, there was the federal task force that was created, Operation Lady, Just, um, Operation Lady Justice, um, that kind of sparked this. And then since then, there have been states that have done efforts, whether it be through legislation, task force to address this issue. And um, so that's kind of how this project came about. Um, here in Nebraska, we had a legislative bill 154 that was um, seeking to address this issue here in this state. Um, and then also we need to think about measuring a hidden population is inherently difficult, especially um, this population, as we know there's a lack of data in general when it comes to anything indigenous. Um, and then when you think about <clears throat> missing persons, um, sometimes you don't even know they're missing until maybe they've been found. Um, you also need to think about the intentional um, going missing, like a victim escaping abuse and needing to get away, or the unintentional, whether that be like crime related, like human trafficking or um, homicide. So when it comes to this population, we need to think about those kind of issues when it comes to really understanding the scope of missing persons. So with that, um, the entire project, we start to understand like how big is the problem in Nebraska and can we reliably measure missing native persons? What are some barriers to reporting, investigating and solving these cases? And then um, providing recommendations. But for today's presentation, we're just gonna focus on that first point of how big is the problem here in Nebraska, and then can we reliably measure missing native persons? Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Wright. Thank you, thank you, Sheena. <clears throat> okay, so we just need to jump right into it because we don't have a ton of time. We're gonna talk about the methodology. What did we do? How did we do it? And then um, focus just on the findings with regard to the quantitative data. So first and foremost, we have to understand missing persons um, really as a point in time, time count. So that's because missing person cases are very dynamic. A person can be reported as missing one day and then found taken off of a missing person's list, you know, three days later, three months later, they can go back on to the list at any given time as well. So we need to understand that the number of missing persons as well as who's actually missing is going to change depending on when you draw the data, when you collect the data. So again, our data are really should be understood as point in time counts um, of the missing persons cases at the days and the times that we drew the data. So um, we ended up, we wanted to get a little bit of a look at multiple time points um, for missing persons cases in Nebraska. So we ended up pulling data from missing persons lists uh, at four points during the year 2020, which will always go down in history <laughs> as a remarkable year um, because of COVID. So uh, we did pull, we did collect both quantitative and qualitative data. Um, again, I'm gonna focus on the quantitative data in this presentation. Um, our data <clears throat> lists that we pulled um, names of missing persons from came from three missing persons lists. One was the Nebraska missing persons list, the state list. Another one was NamUs, the National Missing and Unidentified Persons list. And then there was NICMIC, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children's missing persons list. And again, we collected um, these names at four points in time in January, March, June, and October of 2020. Obviously, the lockdowns for COVID did occur right around March 2020. We did see a little bit of a dip in the data, as you'll uh, see in just a minute. But we did, uh, we wanted to supplement the um, quantitative data with qualitative data. I'm not gonna talk about the qualitative data here, but I do want everybody to know that we did take significant efforts to um, 
hear voices from multiple people around the issue of missing and murdered native um, Nebraskans. So we did listening sessions with tribal communities in Nebraska. We took um, notes from the themes that came up. In all of these, um, in all of our qualitative data, we, we asked the participants, what is it, you know, that, that um, are potential barriers to reporting native um, missing person cases and investigating them generally, and then as they pertain specifically to Native Americans in Nebraska. Um, we also asked um, law enforcement departments across the state to provide us with their missing persons policies, and we did sort of a thematic analysis of those. And then we capped off the qualitative data by conducting interviews with victim service providers and law enforcement personnel across the state. Some might have been tribal affiliated, others might have um, just worked with tribal um, communities or been adjacent to them at some point. Um, so to get straight to the quantitative findings about the scope of missing persons in uh, Nebraska, especially as they pertain to Native Americans, um, and what sort of characteristics these cases looked like. We first looked at um, the rate of missing persons across Nebraska as a whole. And then we looked at various um, racial categories. So the, the Nebraska missing persons rate was fairly stable across all of our four points in time. It was around uh, about three people per 10,000 Nebraskans would have been um, missing at any at those time points. Um, then we looked at the missing person rate among the various racial categories that we could look at. And um, that's where we started to find some disparities. So we find that missing per, the missing persons rate among Native Americans in Nebraska was the second highest um, across all four points in time in any of the racial categories, it was only second highest. Um, it was only uh, slightly lower than the missing persons rate for African-Americans in Nebraska. So for instance, at time one per um, 10,000 persons in Nebraska, we would find that about 13 would be um, reported as missing and they were Native American compared to uh, African-American missing persons um, in Nebraska would, would have been about 14. And, and um, you can see that the numbers are fairly stable. Again, at time two, that's March 31st of 2020, we do see a dip across everybody, um, mostly because of, we think the COVID uh, lockdowns had taken place right, right before then. Another way to look at this data is to compare um, the racial makeup of Nebraska's population to the racial makeup of Nebraska's missing persons population. So if you expect parity or proportionality um, in uh, the racial distribution of native Amer or, uh, missing persons in Nebraska, you would expect the red lines here and the um, gray lines to be approximately equal for each racial category, okay? So for instance, we see um, that 88% of Nebraska's population is white, okay? But we see that only 67% of Nebraska's missing persons population is white, right? So they're underrepresented um, among native um, uh, of, um, among missing persons compared to what you would expect given their racial makeup in the state. Now, when you look at black and native American, um, American groups, that's where you see the numbers are flipped. So for instance, um, the Nebraska population has about 5% African Americans, and yet they make up almost 20% of the, of the Nebraska missing persons population. So here you see that they are overrepresented by about four times 
what you would expect their their numbers to be given their representation in the Nebraska population. The three same minutes. thing or very similar. Is there a question? Oh, three minutes. Sorry. Oh, thanks. Okay. So the same thing is um, is true for Native Americans. They make up about one and a half percent of the Nebraska population, but uh, four and a half percent of the Nebraska Native American, I mean, uh, missing persons population. And that's about three times their their population that you would expect from the state. Um, a couple other things about the profile of um, Native American missing persons cases. The majority were um, minor boys. We expected this to be girls and women. We did not find that. Um, at each time point, uh, the majority of Native American missing persons were uh, minor boys. Almost 10% of the Native American missing persons cases were repeatedly missing. So they were identified as missing. They came off the list at some point. They went back on the list. And Dr. Richards can talk about that more during the Q&A session if you would like. Uh, we also wanted to see what um, missing persons list was the most comprehensive and reliable. And we found that um, the Nebraska missing persons list uh, had the most names and um, was probably the most accurate of all three of the missing persons lists that we checked. Uh, we also wanted to see if any of the missing persons cases, the native missing persons cases, were associated with any violent or nonviolent crime in the state of Nebraska. And we did not find any overlap between Native American missing persons cases and um, law enforcement cases. Um, I will leave this up for just a second and just say we wanted to capture tribal members' perspectives on what could be barriers to reporting and investigating missing persons cases. We found a lot of potential barriers from their perspectives, things like system, systemic issues of poverty and isolation, domestic violence, and things like that. They had a lot of questions about who to report to, when to report a missing case, where they should go, how they should do it. So I think there's a knowledge gap there. And then I think another main takeaway from our study was that they actually perceived, and we shouldn't be surprised by this, but um, they perceived that there could be possible negative consequences for involving the system, i.e. reporting anyone uh, as missing to police officers or any other representatives of the state because they were afraid that in response they might have negative consequences like um, protective services would come in and take their babies away. So, um, we uh, we have a lot more to talk about. We have we can answer and address questions um, in the Q and A, but we hope to um, use the methodology that we have used in Nebraska and move forward working with New Mexico, their Department of Indian Affairs, to essentially replicate the study in Nebraska and see what kinds of patterns we uncover there. Thank you all so much. Thank you for that. Um, 15 minutes sure goes quickly, doesn't it? <laughs> I have a lot of questions. I hope other folks do. Uh, I will be watching the question and answer. We'll have time at the end for discussion. So for anyone in the audience who has questions, please pop those in, those, in there as, um, as your questions arise. Now we're going to do our next lightning 15 minute talk. Uh, we're going to hear from Dr. McKinley. Dr. McKinley is an associate professor at the Tulane University School of Social Work. Her background has a very uh, New Orleans vibe to me right now. Uh, her work focuses on families, health equity, sex differences, women's health, gender violence, wellness, resilience, and transcendence. She works uh, primarily with indigenous communities focused on historical oppression, mental and behavioral health, violence, and implications for clinical research. Uh, Dr. McKinley also specializes in working in community-engaged research, uh, focusing on research that is culturally relevant and effective um, with a multi-tiered and sustainable approach. I know she's going to talk more about that, so I will be quiet and let her take the lead. 
Thank you so much, Kitty. Uh, that is a that is a big job, and you're doing amazing. So happy to be here with y'all um, today. I'm going to be talking to you um, about culturally relevant risk and protective factors related to violence and health inequities experienced by Indigenous peoples, primarily, you know, violence and substance use, how they're inter, um, interrelated. Um, first, I want to say uh, or thank you um, to uh, number one, the Indigenous peoples whose land unceded lands I'm had the honor to live upon. I'm in the New Orleans area, um, otherwise known as Gobancha by the Choctaw um, it, uh, Native Americans of this tribe, as well as the Louisiana, Mississippian tribes, and uh, also work with tribes in the Northwest. I also want to acknowledge the funding sources, primarily NIH, who has funded this clinical trial, I'll report some results to you on, uh, as well as the pilot results. And I, although you only see me up here, I want to bring forward all of the incredible contributors who have built this program. Uh, I'll present results for called the Weaving Healthy Families Program or Chaka Achapa Natana. Uh, this is a, a program that prevents substance abuse and violence that has been built over about 12 years of research of community based participatory research. And this is that we show the community advisory board. Uh, uh, the person on the very right there, Dr. Harold Combi, has passed away since uh, we've started this project and we dedicate the program to him because it really is a lot of the visions that he has had for the tribe intergenerationally, really. And so I just wanna bring forward all of the, uh, all of the incredible people who have really given rise to the, this program um, happening. So today uh, I'm going to kind of step back a little bit, less of a focalized uh, way of thinking about this to understand why, why is systemic and structural violence happening at such a high rate, in particular, given that historically gender roles uh, for indigenous women and it, uh, in gender roles in general were much more expansive and egalitarian. So why now do we find that a lot of times, as you can see, a lot of these health inequities, why are they at a disproportionately high rate? And so that's kind of a broader question that's really thread through all of the work that I've done, but also to see how structures of settler colonization are really the conduit of oppression. And so whether it be violence, substance abuse, um, problems with the system, systemic violence, bias, it, it goes through the lens of settler colonial historical oppression, which have really changed the worldviews and the life ways of what's now known as Turtle Island where we live today. So this is just kind of a, a pictorial graphic of, of what my journey has been like over the last 12 years. Again, I mentioned, First of all, I, I want to acknowledge my own positionality as a you know, person of settler colonial background um, and, and how and whether I should do this at all. And so that was the first study that I ever did was really to interview and work with indigenous and non-indigenous researchers of, you know, should I even look at this? Like, what is my role? I don't want to perpetuate problems. I don't want to do more harm, um, but it's such an important challenge and there's so many beautiful strengths as well. And so that first study was whether and how to do this. And I learned from researchers really some strategies for ethical and um, uh, practic practical kind of toolkit to set up studies in a good way. And they really kind of follow the um, you know, relational responsible research that other people have talked about as well. The community-based participatory research, the long-term engagement, the getting invite invited, allowing for a tribal perspective, you know, building infrastructure, a lot of these tools really have set up the rest of the work, work to, to, to turn out in a good way successfully, and also with tribal capacity building. And so the next study was uh, really on listening to women's stories of violence against women and the professionals that worked with them. So it was really about the system and women's stories. And that led to the development of the framework of historical oppression, resilience, and transcendence. So really situating structural violence in, in kind of its uh, settler colonial uh, framing and how that, that has changed and reversed a lot of gender roles and treatment and how that really is a, a determinant for a lot of the mental, physical health inequities we see today. And so looking across the ecological levels of you know, community, family, individual risk and protective and promotive factors that are culturally relevant, relevant and how this relates to more of a wellness approach and the medicine wheel, which is the holistic way that indigenous peoples you know, uh, traditionally have viewed health um, despite much variability across different nations. And so we developed that framework as well as the historical oppression scale and the family resilience scale to measure whether you know, these things we identified through about a thousand you know, um, interviews and, and focus groups, whether they predict kind of outcomes related to violence and substance abuse. And we found that they did. And then the, the next study um, that I'm gonna be sharing results with you about is what are these risk and protective factors and um, how do you infuse them in a, a, an intervention? 
And so that's kind of, I'll pre present results for you about that today. And then finally, the question really is, comes back as who and what is the intervention for, right? If, if a lot of the challenges are being introduced by structures of uh, settler colonization that are infused and internalized in communities and institutions and families and, and people's minds, then what, what is the intervention for and how we're all really um, implicated um, in either perpetuating these structures or, or really redressing them and how to do that? So I know these questions are really big, but I think it's fun. It's good to go kind of take a focalized look, but also kind of step back and understand why. So a lot of people think, you know, maybe if you don't have indigenous background of, you know, then why, what, how is it rele relevant to, to me, for instance? Well, the whole world has been colonized and the same structures of kind of missionaries, merchants, military oppression, they're patterns that you can see across the world. And they're really based on kind of a hetero patriarchy, hetero paternalistic idea of gender. Um, I mean, if you go really back, it goes back to kind of the Roman, um, uh, you know, Christianity assimilation process is kind of where it came. And then you see it spreads across the world. And I found out my own background is from Ireland. And I found out uh, actually the British use the same, they practice those tools uh, as an experiment on Ireland and then they brought them to the US. So if you do look into your own history, even if you have some European and or uh, African, because there's a tripartite model of African settler chattel sl slaves that were needed to do the labor, we're all connected, it's all connected. And there, therefore, our, all of our liberation and, and experiences are, are connected in the same way and also oppressed. And so it really is relevant for all people. And that, so instead of having more of a dominant mindset, how can we kind of recenter indigenous worldviews where many ancestors have, you know, might have their own linkages if they could like locate them, um, rather than kind of working for more of a perpetuating the same harm through a colonial mindset and how, how those things have been internalized without even knowing it. So I won't go through all of these, but these are just some examples of how, how really indigenous and, and Western worldviews have clashed and how they were brought in. I'm just gonna focus especially on the family and relational level since we're looking at violence. So with, with Western settler colonialization, really this again, heteropatriarchal, so more of a male run and heteropaternal male red nuclear household really was brought in. And with the communities that I work with, it, they were more matrilineal, matrilocal. People did different things. They were complementary, but they weren't hierarchical. So difference wasn't, wasn't a deficit. Difference was something, sometimes people had special uh, strengths or were acknowledged um, for more of a gender expansive you know, worldview. Some tribes had three to five genders, you know, in terms of a two-spirit and different, different um, roles and uh, uh, roles in the different tribal communities. And so it was just a, a very different way of structuring society. And with the entrance of you know, settler colonization, the violence and the, the views and the perceptions towards women really changed into egalitarian. A lot of gods and deities were women and, and they were sacred to really dehumanizing and, and have, having more of an inferior, inferior approach to thinking about indigenous peoples in general, but also women and um, gender minorities. And so when we think about this, this you know, we, we know that the, the, the history isn't equal, right? Uh, we live on a colonized land. That means that the narrative that is told by the person, people in power, right? And so these worldviews are not equally valued. And, and this comes through in our research protocols, paradigms, practices, and principles, and also our treatment protocols, paradigms, principles, and practices. And so to think about this more holistically, we need to step back and say, how can we redress not only the violence against uh, women and children, but, but the, 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 the worldviews that perpetuate and drive them with these settler colonial tactics. And so the kind of long-term future is how to balance and also really uh, lift up, use, use, use the, the, the power and the resources that were built off the land that we live to really lift up those worldviews that many return to for the healing. So just to give you a few examples of some of these um, tactics that were brought in with colonization that I found, and, and this is uh, from kind of Paulo Freire's uh, Pedagogy of the Press, many of these anti-dialogic tactics, what I found in, hist in history, can be found also at the more contemporary uh, community, family, and individual levels. And so these, these tactics such as divide and rule, you know, manipulate leaders to, to sign treaters, treaties, introduce alcohol as a form of kind of uh, undermining the authority, uh, you know, pitting tribes and families against each other, destroying food sources, war, 
these, this conquest, divide and rule, manipulation, cultural invasion, these are tactics that were brought in. And these really contrast the unity, uh, cohesion, organization, cultural synthesis that were protective factors. In the research that I've done across you know, these 12 years, I've seen these same tactics um, manifest themselves in different ways. You know, if you look at conquest, we have the boarding schools, removal of children, why white people are scared of the child criminal justice system, you know, removing land, uh, oppressing people through sharecropping uh, roles. And then you can see at the uh, institutional level, right, there's more of a, go a governmental structure was brought in with it, uh, you know, ICRA in 1934 that, that it was imposed, so a different way of governing that changed from selective to more family and power kind of based. Um, people coming to the system with impunity because of jurisdictional problems and the lack of funding or resources. So these are things that I heard from women and professionals. So people don't want to get treated in a system that will continue the same violence and follows the same ideology. And so these things follow these different levels, community, family, fragmented ser uh, services, lack of reliability, these kind of complexities um, in the system. And I also saw these at the family and relational level. So there would be families against each other. And if you look at the power dynamics, the simple power and control wheel, these are what they are systemically and interpersonally. You know, manipulation, manipulation, using children, family, loved ones, divide and rule, separating your loved ones. If you don't do what I say, I'm going to hurt your loved ones. Coercion, threat, you know, threat, stalking, emotional abuse. These same tactics can be, they're embodied, right? They're embodied like fractals at the higher to the lower levels. And they're internalized. And we we fragment ourselves, we compartmental ourselves as lack of holistic beings. And so we hurt ourselves and each other because of these uh, tools to divide and oppress, to gain land, to make a place their own, um, exploit labor um, based on really inegalitarian types of, uh, types of values. And I've seen that these, these, uh, the effects of this have affected uh, families that are generationally, women and children across, across the board. Three minutes. Yes, this Weaving Healthy Families program really integrates the protective fac factors that we have found in research, but also historically, matrilineal, connection to land, family and extended kinship, indigenous worldviews and culturation, spirituality and faith, subsistence and food waste. We've integrated this in this program that prevents substance abuse and violence. And we also look at why and how it's working by using a community-based participatory uh, approach and implementation science. So we wanna also build up the, the communities. Uh, the, it's a 10 session um, program that focuses on wellness, this framework of historical oppression. We center food waste, communication, substance abuse, um, and violence prevention, and, and what are healthy relationships, um, emotional regulation, problem solving. People share a meal, include tribal food ways, and then they learn the same content in their developmentally tailored group groups with um, parents, uh, children, young children, and the four age groups. Um, they start with the Then they come back together with Connecting My Family. And again, um, this, this uh, program infuses talking circles, it's family focus, it's the medicine wheel, tribal values that I'm talking to you about, the worldviews, and teachings through like the sacred tree in different ways of communicating tribal stories. Just real briefly, uh, we have done a pilot and we've seen that after the intervention, there is improvement. We found improvement in communal mastery, feelings of social support, family resilience, and the environment without violence has improved as well as substance abuse redu was reduced after the intervention as well as um, anxiety and, and depression, emotional regulation. And, and then people even uh, drank and eat, ate less sugar sweetened beverages and, and ate and lived in a more healthy way. We found interestingly that people who reported higher levels of historical oppression found greater declines, meaning something about understanding personal problems in systemic ways provides relief. So we need to start to connect those things in the present. Most importantly, if not, uh, or more importantly, is building up the structure. So this is community-based program. We've trained over 60 community health representatives from the tribe. We um, are working with the juvenile justice system and the court system and the Boys and Girls Club to sustain this program over time. We have over 500 uh, family participants and have um, people have gone in to get their PhDs and, and uh, become educated. In the process, we have decolonizing dialogues in our groups. We, we do family talking circles um, and community health representative talking circles so we can have con continued healing among the healers. I was just back there last week and there were a number of suicides. And so having um, you know, a, a consistent place to heal in a tribal way with these talking circles has been really, really important to build communities of health. And so 
I'm ending with seven seconds, but I just want to say you cookie. And I do have a, a self-care workshop of how we can kind of work to um, dismantle our own colonial mindsets. Um, and so feel free to reach out to me if you'd like to join that. But Yakoki, thank you for thinking in, uh, about these issues. And I appreciate you being honored to be asked. Thank you, Catherine. That was a master lesson and putting a lot of information in 15 minutes. Well done. <laughs> Again, I want to encourage people. I've seen a couple of questions come through. Uh, please do add to those. We will get to those at the end. Um, and I am going to introduce our third and final panelist for today, uh, Dr. Andre Rose. Uh, hello, Andre. Uh, Dr. Rose is a professor of justice and the associate dean for academic and student affairs in the College of Health at the University of Alaska Anchorage. His research focuses on violence against American Indian and Alaska Native women and men. He has been a visiting executive research fellow at the National Institute of Justice and continues to work on NIJ's program of research on violence against Indian women living in tribal communities. Uh, he's here to present on findings from a national survey and I'm excited to hear more. Thank you so much, Katie. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay. As Katie mentioned, my name is Andre Rose. I'm the Associate Dean in the College of Health at the University of Alaska Anchorage. Uh, before I begin, I want to first acknowledge uh, that I have the uh, privilege of living and working on the unceded lands of the Denina people, who have taken great care of this land since time immemorial, uh, and they continue to do so today. I also want to acknowledge, uh, if I can move to the next slide, the uh, National Institute of Justice who provided funding uh, for the study. And as others have mentioned, the opinions, findings, and conclusions and recommendations are mine, uh, and they do not necessarily reflect those of the uh, Department of Justice. Today, I will uh, provide a very brief summary of uh, the work uh, that I completed on this report uh, that examined violence against American Indian and Alaska Native women and men. Uh, the data that were used for this report came from the National Intimate Partner and in Sexual Violence Survey that was conducted by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, in 2010, CDC, with some funding from NIJ, uh, provided or conducted an oversample of uh, people who identified themselves as American Indian or uh, Alaska Native. And using those data, uh, I uh, looked at uh, the lifetime and past year prevalence of psychological aggression, physical violence, stalking, uh, and sexual violence. The report also provides detailed information about both the impact of violence uh, and the race of the perpetrators. And overall, there are five key findings uh, from the study, and I'll start by showing a brief video that summarizes these uh, key findings. The stories of American Indians and Alaska Natives are as varied and nuanced as the people themselves. But the latest study from the National Institute of Justice finds one troubling through line that links these stories, the experience of high rates of violence. Like songs and oral histories, Science can raise awareness by quantifying the severity of violence. It's time to hear what the numbers are saying. The vast majority of American Indian and Alaska Native women and men have experienced violence in their lifetime, and one in three have experienced recent violence in the past year. Those levels are higher than the general population, but that's not where the inequalities end. The study also measures a range of impacts as well as services needed because of violence. What's behind those numbers? Let's start with the finding that for American Indians and Alaska Natives, violence doesn't discriminate by gender. Women and men share similar rates of victimization. That means almost three million American Indian and Alaska Native women and men have been victims of violence. To put that number in perspective, Imagine if everyone in the state of Iowa stood up, or every resident of Orlando, Dallas, Detroit, Anchorage, and Atlanta combined. That's the scale of the violence, but what about the scope? 
The NIJ study breaks types of violence into four categories, and violence against American Indians and Alaska Natives is high across all of them. Take stalking, for example. It can be a gateway to more aggressive violence, and repeated, unwanted, fear-inducing experiences come in many forms. Lifetime estimates of stalking for women in the study are almost double those of non-Hispanic whites. Add male and female victims together, and that's more than 1.2 million people. That would fill 20 sports stadiums if every single ticket holder had been stalked. Being forced or coerced to engage in unwanted sexual activity is another form of violence, a form all too familiar to American Indians and Alaska Natives. For example, these mothers, daughters, and sisters face almost two times the risk of sexual violence with penetration as non-Hispanic white women. Overall rates of physical violence by intimate partners in the past or present are even higher, from being shoved to having a gun or knife used on them. More than one in every two women and more than one in every three men have experienced physical violence by intimate partners in their lifetimes, comparatively much higher than the physical victimization rates over the lifetimes of non-Hispanic whites. Of course, not all violence is sexual or physical, so the NIJ study also examines psychological aggression. For example, expressions of anger that seem dangerous or humiliating, or controlling access to birth control. Overall, psychological aggression affects more than one in every two women and men. Psychological aggression may not be as obvious as broken bones or bruises, but it is real. Among victims, 63% of women report partners tracking them, and 55% of women report being kept from family or friends. These are just a few findings, but remember, they are numbers that correspond to real victims who would fill the entire state of Iowa. Now picture if 97% of women and 90% of men in Iowa were victimized by people of other races and ethnicities, interracial perpetrators who violated the safety of their schools, workplaces, parks, homes, and bedrooms. Numbers alone don't tell the whole story, but they do point to a dangerous gap. Most federally recognized tribes don't have the legal authority to criminally prosecute non-Indians, even for crimes committed on tribal lands. So what does it all mean? The impacts of high rates of violence against American Indians and Alaska Natives range from missed days of work or school to physical injuries. It's not surprising that services are needed, like medical care to treat injuries. But here's where the NIJ results uncover another glaring disparity. Almost 40% of female victims who need services can't get them, compared with only 15% of non-Hispanic white female victims who fall through the cracks. American Indians and Alaska Natives deserve better, and now there is science to prove it. These numbers are not abstract. They bear witness to real people, mothers, girlfriends, brothers and grandfathers. Our hope is that this study will lead to a story of a new beginning, one where all of us listen to what the science is saying, what the victims are saying, and unite to prevent violence wherever it happens. The stories of American Indians and Alaska Natives are as varied and nuanced as the people them. There we go. Uh, many thanks to uh, Terry Henry for uh, of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians for narrating on that video. Uh, and here are the five key findings that I want to focus on today in this presentation. Uh, and these were all covered in the video. First, uh, most American Indian and Alaska Native women and men uh, have experienced violence uh, in their lifetime. 
Uh, second, uh, we found that the rates were fairly similar for men and women, uh, but they were victimized in different ways. Third, uh, as other research has shown, we've uncovered that victimization rates are higher for people who identified as American Indian or Alaska Native than for people who identified as being uh, non-Hispanic uh, and white. Fourth, uh, American Indian and Alaska Native female victims were more likely to need services, but it was also more challenging for them to access those services. And finally, uh, we found that interracial violence was much more prevalent than intra-racial violence. So in the remaining slides, I'll provide just some uh, very uh, key statistics on these five findings. Um, <clears throat> we found uh, that more than 80% of American Indian and Alaska Native women and men had experienced violence in their lifetime. That's more than four out of every five American Indian or Alaska Native person, or almost three million. And the lifetime prevalence rates uh, were similar for women and men, with 84% of women and 82% of men reporting that they had experienced violence at some point in their lifetime. We found that the lifetime victimization rates for psychological aggression and physical violence were fairly similar for both uh, women and men. But we found that women were significantly more likely to have experienced sexual violence, and they were significantly more likely to have experienced uh, stalking. More than half had experienced sexual violence at some point in their lifetime, and almost half had experienced stalking. Uh, as noted in other research, we also found that the prevalence rates were higher for people who identify as American Indian or Alaska Native than for people who identify as white and uh, non-Hispanic. For the lifetime rates, American Indian and Alaska Native women were 18% more likely to have experienced violence, and men were 28% more likely to have experienced violence. The differences were even greater in the past year rates, uh, where we found that 40% of American Indian and Alaska Native women had experienced violence just in the past year and they were 74% more likely to have experienced violence in the past year than non-Hispanic uh, white women. More than a third of American Indian and Alaska Native men had experienced violence in the past year, and they were 35% more likely uh, than non-Hispanic white men to experience violence. We also found, as I mentioned before, that American Indian and Alaska Native uh, female victims were more likely to need services. 41% reported having physical injuries, 49% reported that they needed services, and more than a third reported that they needed medical care. This may indicate that the severity of violence is greater among American Indian and Alaska Native women. Uh, unfortunately, uh, they were also, it was also more difficult for them to access services. Uh, more than a third were not able to access services. In this graph, we're looking at uh, victims who needed services. And what you can see is that among American Indian and Alaska Native female victims who needed services, more than a third were not able to get services. So again, it was more challenging uh, for them to access uh, services. Three minutes. Thank you. Uh, the, the final finding that uh, we focused on was the level of intra-racial and interracial violence. And as you can see in this graph, almost all American Indian and Alaska Native, Native victims uh, had experienced violence by a perpetrator who was not American Indian uh, or Alaska Native. Uh, and about a third had experienced violence from a perpetrator who was American Indian uh, or Alaska Native. And this was true for every type of violence uh, that we examined. 85 to 96% of American Indian and Alaska Native victims had experienced at some point in their life violence by a perpetrator who was of a different race uh, and ethnicity. So in terms of our key conclusions, uh, this study obviously had, uh, as every study does, lots of uh, limitations. Those are uh, covered in the report. Uh, and so we must continue our work to raise awareness and our understanding of violence against American Indians uh, and Alaska Natives. 
Uh, the results do show that there are continuing disparities in both health outcomes uh, and in access to health care, and that finding supports uh, the greater need for services and our efforts to increase services for American Indian and Alaska Native populations. And then finally, as you saw, the results show that interracial violence was far more prevalent than intra-racial violence, and that supports the efforts of tribes to prosecute non-Indian offenders. So in my 15 minutes, those are the, the five key findings uh, from the study and some of the key implications. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Andre. Uh, I always appreciate the um, creative ways of disseminating reporting findings. If you're like me, if you get over about 150, I'm like, I don't know how many people that is. And so some of those data visualizations I think are really helpful and powerful. I'll also put in a personal thank you to Andre for wading through that dense, complicated data. Uh, I believe he was even answering emails of mine when I was finishing my dissertation in 2016 saying, when is that report going to come out? When is that report going to come out so that we could utilize this national sample um, as a baseline? So thank you for that, Andre. Um, I've noticed that Tina has been putting resources into the chat list. So if people haven't been um, noticing those, there's a couple of resources there. Um, I'm going to open up with a question for the Nebraska folks uh, that was put into the chat. Um, uh, I'll just read it out loud. In the Nebraska research, was there a difference between Native Americans who live on reservations and those that live in other rural or urban places? So, <clears throat> well, is Tara, are you there? Because I know we had some breakdowns by um, jurisdiction, but we didn't report any of that stuff. So you want to overview that or? So we did create some heat maps um, for the counts, um, but that's at the jurisdictional level, like Dr. Wright indicated. So we didn't do any analysis um, based on the location of where the person went missing. And mostly that is because that data was almost always missing from the um, publicly available missing persons data. So the best we could do is identify the jurisdiction to which the missing persons report was reported. Um, so like the, the basically the law enforcement agency, right? That was um, responsible for taking that missing persons report. Um, which really does not get at the question that this person is asking. But what I will say is that in this next study um, that is also being generously supported by NIAJ, um, where we're working with the um, India, Indian Affairs Department in the state of New Mexico, we really want to get um, much more into the context of missing persons cases than we were able to in the first Nebraska study. Um, and so we hope to, to do a lot more um, in terms of trying to gather that contextual information around, you know, why a person goes missing and how that case is resolved. Um, so stay tuned. We hope to have those types of answers for you soon. Thank you. Relatedly, I had a question in those three data sources that you used about how uh, missing persons are identified as American Indian or Alaska Native, as we know, there's often complications and undercounts. And, and I, so I was just curious about that, if you could speak to that at all. <laughs> Go Tara. <laughs> um, so it, it was the rate, you know, racial identity was um, based on how it was reported, um, which is important because, for example, Hispanic ethnicity is not a category that is used. So we couldn't um, look at, you know, folks who are identifying as white non-Hispanic versus white Hispanic, et cetera. Um, because what was important about the study was we did look at the scope of all missing persons so that we could then try to um, examine missingness across these different racial groups. But you bring up a 
really good point. And we talk about it in depth in the NIJ final report and um, the manuscript that came out of that data is we just don't know, right? We don't know the level of um, misclassification, right? Um, and we don't, you know, um, and that's, uh, again, why trying to liaise with the um, tribal communities and identify um, folks who were not reported missing, which we, we did do that. Um, this was a partnership with the ne Nebraska Commission on Indian Affairs. So we, we did a lot of um, working through the commission, trying to get at that information, and then also having the commission cross-check the data that we were pulling down from those lists um, to really try to understand if anyone who was listed on the missing persons list as um, not American Indian Alaska Native were or vice versa. Um, but we we weren't able to capture anyone who was not reported, officially reported missing, and we didn't identify any misclassification. However, that absolutely does not mean that was not um, going on. It just means that even though we made attempts, we 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 didn't uncover those phenomena. And I will say, I think it was about 10%. Maybe up to thirteen percent of the cases didn't have race at all, so um, they could have been native, they could have been not native, and there's no way for us to have figured that out. Thanks. I think it's such an important point to make when we're pointing out these sort of rates and comparisons of um, how I, I don't want to say flawed, but I will say flawed so much of our data we work with is uh, and what the implications are for getting a more, more accurate estimates. Yeah, and so one of the things that we um, usually say in these presentations, and I know we were really short on time, is we have this slide and we talk about how we wanted to um, say what we do, do what we say and show our work because we realize that all of the, all of these types of studies have so many limitations and measurement issues. And so we we can't speak to all, all people and all things, right? We can only speak to this like one sliver um, of the problem that you know we were able to measure with our design. And it's only a starting point. And everyone who comes behind us will hopefully improve upon it. Absolutely, absolutely. Good point. Um, there's a question in our question and answer for Dr. Wright. Um, can you describe the linking process you use to link missing persons records to see if they were associated with violent crimes? I, I think it was just names. The names are all uh, available on the missing persons list. So we had um, the, the names and their racial uh, category and we sent that, I want to say, to Nebraska State Patrol to do a cross-check with their um, cases to see if any of the names that were identified as natives um, were associated either as a perpetrator or a victim, potential victim, in the cases uh, as managed by the Nebraska State Patrol. And Tara can tell me if I'm wrong on that. <laughs> Together, we are one person. <laughs> no, that's that's right. I mean, I, I the one thing I would add is the Nebraska missing persons list. Right. This is this is being, you know, drawn down from law enforcement data. Right. So the Nebraska State Patrol could see more information on missing persons than we could. Right. Because we were pulling it down from the public facing portal. But Nebraska State Patrol controls the Nebraska missing persons list. So by submitting the the names, ages, and you know race, uh, racial, ethnic identifiers based on the data we could pull down from the missing persons list, they could actually see like what was that incident report number right um, for that missing person. Um, so they had a lot more information than we had with the publicly available data. And as Dr. Wright said, you know. All, what what they reported back to us was that none of the missing persons um, that we submitted to them were um, uh, missing in uh, sort of collaboration with a, an incident report of a of a of a crime, right? Nor where were there any um, you know reported leads, et cetera, 
regarding their missingness being in association with a, a crime. Tina, did you have something you wanted to add to that question? Trying to, trying to look at three places at once. <laughs> There was a question, I will note, there was a question uh, for Dr. Rose about um, any plans to follow up with the uh, report, the survey again to do another um, surveillance. And uh, Tina did answer that, that NIJ is in discussion with CDC right now. Do you have anything to add to that? Okay. Tina's doing all our heavy lifting over here in the chat box. Um, there have been two questions, one of which was uh, uh, Dr. McKinley responded to, but questions from non-Native uh, folks who are interested in working with uh, tribal or Indigenous communities. And I wanted to give the opportunity to our Omaha crew and Andre, uh, if you wanted to share any thoughts or ideas. Uh, sounds like a couple different people have that question, or Dr. McKinley, if you want to add anything. I guess I can go ahead and start. I'll put a plug in for a great book by uh, Sean Wilson called Research a Ceremony. Great place to start. Uh, he provides some wonderful advice uh, for how to do research uh, in Indian country. Uh, and he has lots of wonderful, wonderful recommendations. But the one that I would highlight is really to start with a question that is of interest to the people that we're doing research on. Too often, I think we can sit back in our offices and think, oh, wouldn't it be great if we did a research project on this? Uh, but unless that is of interest to the local communities, uh, it is uh, uh, not gonna go very far. So, so starting with a good research question, and working with tribal partners to develop their research questions, I think is a is a key part of the process. So I'll just add a little bit. There's there's a lot like like um Dr. Rose said, which I've cited your work so many times. It's it's so fun to see you in the in the flesh here. <laughs> but um, you know, it, it, there's a lot of great models like you mentioned, and um, I think the challenge typically too, is also kind of what worldview people bring in. Um, I think of Michael Hart has some really great work on um, indigenous worldviews as well. So that's one thing is kind of getting really educated about um, what positionality you bring in and what that might mean. Um, and then, you know, following some of these protocols of like community-based participatory research, really spending time um, listening, following, um, kind of being secondary in terms of uh, direction. Because that only not only helps it, you know, the success is because of that, because you're following what's what's in believing people about what's needed and what's real. And that's really, I definitely have seen that um, play out. Um, but also it really is a big commitment because the implications are high and, and that there's, you're not entering where there's a baseline of trust or equity. You're, you're um, entering where there's 500 years of injustice. So I would say only and in, in, you know, do it only if you really can um, be, you know, honor those responsibilities and those relationships. Otherwise, you know, maybe find some other way to like help with infrastructure or resources in more of a secondary way because the implications are really high, right, to, to continue that harm. And so just be really clear about that and have mentors, um, you know, cultural insiders to guide that process. Um, and so I think that's really, really important to be embedded in, in more support and um, follow safety kind of protocols, you know, cultural safety protocols, really. I'll just say that um, we put together sort of a think, um, a thought piece on um, how to approach uh, research in indigenous communities. Um, and it's available online somewhere, I don't know. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's a lot of things that we could say that would be, I think, instructional and helpful, but I totally agree you want to be responsive to the needs, the desires, the interests of the communities that you're working with. Um, you want to make sure that you're not doing anything that you're not meaning to do, but that would look like it was being ex um, exploitative. Um, and I think you have to 
Um, there's not a ton of us who do this work because it's not super easy. And especially if you study violence, victimization, stuff like that, it can be uh, emotionally difficult as well. Um, so I think you have to have a passion and sort of a desire or a calling to do it. And um, again, check your intentions um, and check your sensitivities, I, I would say. But Sheena wrote the, primarily wrote the paper that we put out on the American Society of Criminology's um, newsletter. And um, I think that it's, uh, it's, it's pretty help, uh, helpful. Um, it's not a book, it's just a few pages. Um, so, and it was a real pleasure to get to see everybody in person, by the way. I've read a lot of people's work here and am kind of fangirling as well. <laughs> I um, unfortunately have the job of keeping an uh, eye on the time. And I think that is such a lovely place to have stopped. I absolutely hear you on, uh, you know, being a big fan of all of the work that you're doing. Um, I think you've all made really important uh, contributions in this area. I, I think I appreciate all your answers for folks who are interested in working with uh, communities that maybe aren't their own. This goes beyond just indigenous communities. and you know, thinking about flexibility, patience, and humility are the three things I, I tell my students when they talk about any community that you're entering. And, you know, the importance, as all of our panelists said, of letting community really lead the sort of intention and purpose and primary questions, having deeply reciprocal relationships. Uh, so what you want isn't always what they want or what you need isn't always what they need. So being mindful of that and transparent about that. Um, and uh, you know, I was also struck by how uh, uh, many of our panelists place this within this larger historical context and being aware of what you bring into this um, within that larger construct and what you represent and where you have power and where that comes from in those relationships. So uh, with that note, I want to thank everyone for spending the, well, for me, it's afternoon. I know Andre hasn't even cracked noon yet um, up there in Alaska. Uh, so I want to thank you all for spending the afternoon with us. Uh, I hope this was helpful. There are resources in the chat before people sign off if you want to take a quick review of that. And thank you to the consortium for making space uh, for us to really focus on these issues of violence in Indigenous communities this month. Thank you. Great job, Dr. Schultz. Thank you, everyone. Good to see everyone. Thank you.